Feast TV is brought to you with support from Missouri Wines, Whole Foods Market, La Col Culinaire, and the Raphael Hotel. Hope you're ready for a drink because this is the craft distilling episode. I'm Kat Neville and this is Feast TV. episode we are exploring craft distilling. Now it used to be in stores like Randall's here in St. Louis when you walked along these big shelves you just see big national brands but now when you turn and look there are tons of things that are made locally in small batches and very very high quality. So the first stop in our distillery crawl is Pinkney Ben. These guys are located in New Haven, Missouri, and they make whiskeys and bourbons and fantastic gins. And they are also experimenting with bringing back these heritage strains of corn. It's a really, really interesting story. So we're gonna head there first. So I am standing here in Pinckney Bend Distillery, which is in the town of New Haven, Missouri, right along the Missouri River. Pinckney Bend, first off, where does that name come from? Pinckney Bend was, uh, was a navigational hazard. There are about five, six, seven steamboats that have sunk and raised from, from around that area. And um, in the town of Pinckney, we survived there for a long period of time, but, but ultimately it never thrived again. When you decided to open up a distillery, why did you choose New Haven? Well, we lived here. <laughs> you know, we had looked at doing a brewery. We had been brewing together for 10 or 15 years, and the numbers didn't work. But as craft brewing began to come into its own, we said, you know, we can do this. And they had a still, and we began playing with it. What we produced was enough to encourage us, and we kept going. And, and today, we, we have, a, have a, a thriving little business. Well, what I really love are the line of whiskeys where they're all barrel finished with these different types of alcohols like sherry and wine and things like that. When you're, when you're a little guy, you know, you don't have to worry so much about, we don't, we don't have to meet a huge market demand. We have to be able to, to sell it in our tasting room. It mm -hmm. has to be good. So what we started doing was taking whiskeys that were already finished and had spent a year in a new oak barrel. What it does is it, um, it rounds everything it, it, out. It like files the edges off, you know? And, and it, it just infuses such beautiful flavor. Exactly, and they're always subtle. They're not, you know, and the key to this, I think, is subtlety. Well, I think it's time to uh, taste a few of these wonderful things. So I'm gonna turn you over to the experts. Come on down, Ken. Thank so you. I heard you had a chance to talk to Ralph about some of our products, and now let's get to the fun part. We're actually going to get to try some of the products. I've been waiting all through that interview just to get to the taste. I can see the suspense building. <laughs> so I'm going to start you off with our sherry cask finish. Those staves are like a sponge, and it's amazing what flavors get pulled out when you introduce that whiskey to it. And what kind of sherry? Uh, this is using Spanish oak Olorosa sherry barrels, so it was an Olorosa sherry. Full disclosure, I have some of this at home, <laughs> and I love it. And just like you said, they're sweet, but not too sweet at all. It's just a beautiful, almost maple syrup kind of a flavor to it, yeah, brown that, sugar. And that's the oak from the whiskey beginning to come out, and the way it starts pairing with all those kind of almost stone fruit flavors that are gonna show up from that sherry, that's exactly kind of the note it makes. I love this. And of course, we have to go with what we're famous for. The gin. The gin. Or American gin. American gin. What does that mean? It, to me, that's going for that sweeter balance of the juniper. And one of the other key ingredients in a gin is the coriander. And depending on where you put that is really going to change its flavor profile. I love gin. You know, a lot of gins will use stuff that didn't quite make the cut. 
for doing a vodka and they assume you just don't notice that you so want to cover have... it up with the tail. Exactly. By not doing that, you're getting this really flavorful shine through of just our base to begin with. It's so mm -hmm. perfumed. It is mm -hmm. just a beautiful. Mm. It's very complex, and it's one of those things where everything else feels like it just blends into this botanical one, wash. one single flavor. There is no one single. It, it, that's the way it should be. You want them all to come together to create kind of a harmony. And the goal in a gin is to create that same harmony. You guys started out with a gin, and your gin has won many, many awards many times over. We were all gin fans, and we started with a gin, and we uh, right out of the gate, we got a, a gold medal at the San Francisco World Spirits Competition. Which is um, huge. It's, it's a very big deal, a very big deal. But you also won in London, didn't you? Yes, we got it. <laughs> but, you know, we got a bronze in London, and I don't normally oh, brag. Oh, I don't normally brag about blondes, bronzes, but I'll take a bronze on gin in London. Yeah, I think so. This is one of my very favorite uh, gins, and how many gins are aged? There's only a there are very there. few across the world that are aged, and this is one that's made right here in New Haven. Right in downtown New Haven. I love the aged gin. You have the aged gin. Yes, we were trying to simulate what old Tom gin would have tasted like, and we did. So did that begin your experimentation with barrel aging, or did it, it, you start barrel aging the whiskeys first? With the gin, we had whiskey barrels that were emptying out, and, uh, and we were thinking, what are we gonna do with these, these barrels? And we said, let's, let's finish some gin in them. There were a couple of gins out there that were being finished, and we did it, and man, this is really good. And we thought, let's roll it out and see. And it was very popular in the tasting room, and it began growing with the distributor. And we said, let's carry this to its logical extreme like we do everything else. <laughs> people like the folks here at Pinkney Bend, you guys are playing with things that, you know, these really big kind of profit-driven um, types of places are not necessarily going to play with. You guys are really able to push boundaries and introduce something to the market that's unique and special that nobody's ever had before. They, they've gotten too big to experiment and we're just the right size to go out and kind of play. And that's part of the fun of being in the craft market is, well, I want to make what I want to drink. Yeah. I don't want to drink what someone else is making. And turns out a lot of people love what we make as well. The next stop on our distillery crawl is Missouri Spirits. They are located in Springfield, Missouri, and not only are they making fantastic bottled spirits, but they have a top-notch bar. So let's head there now and have a drink. So now we are on the west side of beautiful downtown Springfield, Missouri at Missouri Spirits, which is just an incredible distillery here in the heart of the state. And I'm here with the founder, Scott, and I think we're about to go on a tour. And after that, we're gonna go check out what's being made behind the bar. So I think tour first, don't you think? Yeah, let's do it. Okay. Well, so this is our production area. We've been doing this since 2011. This was an old uh, body shop uh, where they painted cars and motorcycles, and we completely gutted the building, um, renovated it, and turned it into our distillery. I love the feel of it. I love how big and open it is. So, Missouri Spirits, the brand, right. are the things that you're making smaller batch here right. for your tasting room, for your clients. Right. But then, in order to make the business grow, you're doing private labeling and you're in 20 states? Roughly. So predominantly what we do is uh, we do co-packing and private label for other companies. Uh, that's the 90% of, of the business that we do. And so yeah. what kinds of things are you making for these other companies? Uh, we do some flavored moonshines uh, is, is predominantly what we do. We also do some uh, smaller bourbon uh, batches for some local restaurants here and uh, looking to do more. That's great. One thing that we're really proud of here is uh, everything in the building we've either uh, designed or we've built ourselves, including the stills. Um, you we, built these yourself? We had them built by a local uh, metal fab guy. There are our own designs. Um, wow. Classic pot still. Um, like the way we designed this one is um, so it's interchangeable, so we can come back later and make different heads, 
we want to do a gin out of the still, we can, we can add a different gin head. Uh, if we wanted to do a vodka, we could do that as well uh, using the same components. So what are you making? We've got a baseline bourbon, we've got a vodka and a corn whiskey that we're doing. We're also doing um, some experimental batches. We're working on some new recipes. What are you experimenting with right now? Right now we're, uh, we're working on a chocolate bourbon. So it's a- A chocolate bourbon. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's got corn, rye, uh, of course your two-row barley, and then uh, we've added some uh, English um, chocolate malt to it as well. On this side of the room is where we do all of our blending. We have a, kind of a sophisticated water system. We, uh, we reverse osmosis everything because that affects either the flavoring or it affects the, the, the taste of the, the bourbon mm -hmm. or the, the flavor of the alcohol. As we're kind of moving through the process, uh, this is where we bottle. Um, this is our, our bottling line here. We knew we had to have a tasting room, a tasting bar. We knew we wanted to sell bottles, and I'm kind of, I'm not really the guy that's gonna just stop at giving people samples. I, you know, we wanted the best cocktails in town. Nice. And what we did was we, we've got the best cocktails in town uh, in more of a laid back environment. So Josh, who is the very talented bartender over my shoulder, is going to show us how to whip up some of his signature cocktails with these Missouri spirits. I'm gonna start off with the Bill's Bullet, which is bourbon, lemon, and an apple tobacco shrub served over smoked ice. It's really, really good. And as the ice melts, it infuses the cocktail with this really beautiful smokiness that is completely unexpected. Should be a really well-balanced cocktail. You shouldn't, nothing should be overpowering anything else. That's good. Next, we'll do cranberry smack. Okay. So this one, we're gonna start with fresh ginger. A couple of cranberries, muddle all that in the glass. Corn whiskey, fresh lime juice, simple syrup. Nice. That's beautiful. So it's very sweet and very tart, and it has a bit of that heat from the ginger at the back of it. Oh, that's good. I mean, this is the kind of thing you can just sit and just enjoy this on a super hot day because it's tart. Yeah. It's tart, but it's not like mouth puckeringly tart. Yeah. It's just refreshing. I love yeah. that. So this is a play on a classic old fashioned. So we've got bourbon soaked cherries, sugar cube, Angostura bitters, orange peel. And then this is basically 180 proof moonshine. So watch your hair. Okay. <laughs> So, and the idea of this is to caramelize the sugar, let it melt into the drink a little better. Two ounces of bourbon, giant ice cube. One giant cube. Perfect. Oh, beautiful. There you go. Thank you. And so, how did you come up with your recipes? Well, I mean, everything's kind of a play on something else. So. The Bill's Bullet is essentially a whiskey sour. It's just kind of doing our own thing on it. Like pre-prohibition days, you only worked with kind of what you had lying around. So since we only worked from three bottles, we have to make inventive ways of doing things. And that's a self-imposed restriction. If we're doing everything here and we want to do like pre-prohibition style cocktails, then we might as well do it just like they did it instead of going and buying store-bought sour mix or over-sugared orange juice. Like, we just hand squeeze, hand do everything. I can go to the grocery store, to the farmer's market, and if I see something that's in a season, I can just, boom, make whatever I want to out of that. When people sit at your bar, what do you want them to experience? What are you trying to create for them? I want them to have a good cocktail, but not feel like they have to come in and wear a suit and tie. You know, I want people to come in in t-shirts and shorts on their bicycles and just have a cocktail. Next up is Still 630, an urban distillery just south of downtown St. Louis. Give me a snapshot of the history of Still 630 and why you started getting into distilling. So we started in 2011, start, moved into the building, started distilling in 2012, opened in public in 2013. I wanted to get into it because I love spirits and I love all the different nuances that you can get from the different grains and ingredients and 
the experimentation is the favorite part, and that's why I love this rack, because these are all experiments. I love the fact that you are almost embodying that spirit of collaboration that's happening in artisan food yeah. right now. I mean, the fact that you're taking this really interesting almost experiment in beer, and then you're experimenting with it further. So right now in the still, you have a peanut butter chocolate milk stout. That's exactly right. That is our third brewery collaboration. This one with four hands with their absence of light we have in there. And so distilling kind of synthesizes those flavors as they come across, mutes some, exacerbates others. But then the barrel sometimes breathes life into them again, or it just compounds those flavors. It's really, it's, it's a ton of fun. Like you said, I'm just playing around in here making booze. What are typically the bases of the spirits? Well, bourbon typically must be corn, but all whiskey comes from grain, so fermented grain. And all different types of grain have different flavors, right? Like bread's a perfect example that I use in our tours. Rye bread tastes different than wheat bread, tastes different than corn bread. And so if you use those different ingredients to make a different spirit, or you use them in different percentages, you're gonna get wildly different flavor combinations. Fruit is the basis of a lot of these spirits, including brandies, but also eau de vie. So let's head out to wine country and meet one of the very first distillers in Missouri. And now we're at Montel Winery in the Augusta region in Missouri, and they're known for their very high quality wines, but they also are making eau de vie and grappa. Let's go talk to Tony now. What do you think of the growth of the spirit industry? I mean, having been in winemaking and really been one of the pioneers in distilling in Missouri, how do you kind of like take this explosion in craft distilling? It's, it's amazing. I would have never thought it would have happened the late 1900s, state decided that they wanted to open up distilling to wineries. And I've always been enamored by the idea of fruit distillates, fruit spirits, eau de vies. So uh, it's an interesting process and, and it took us a long time to learn it, but we have to, first of all, remove this, the pits. Mm -hmm. And then we have to uh, crush it and then pump it into the fermenter and then from there, it's a normal fermentation, just like it would be with any of our wines, except you got the skins and the pulp and everything in there. That's necessary to get those flavors. Huh. And then after that, uh, after the fermentation is complete, then you put it in the distill and heat it up and, and remove that alcohol. So you end up with kind of the essence of peach? Exactly. So show me around the still, kind of tell me what it is that I'm looking at. So this is the, the manway here, that's where you actually fill the machine from. It's actually heated with steam, so this outer jacket here, the uh, stainless part, that's real hot, it heats the mash slowly. You can actually see it start to happen here. It actually, the steam comes up through these bubble plates and it sprays out like that and that helps with the, the refining of the spirits. So only the, the pure vapors come through. This process is amazing to me. Okay, so you essentially are boiling in a way. You're heating this to the point where it becomes steam. Right. The steam rises up through the column, mm -hmm. and then it comes back down in the form of alcohol, and Actually, wait, here we go. Yeah, here, this is the- That was perfect timing. <laughs> right. <laughs> So the first little bit that comes out, I'll sample, and I'll keep smelling it and smelling it until it gets to the point where, you know, I know that it doesn't have any um, of the heads left in it. And now what exactly is in the heads that is undesirable? It's got benzene in it, um, which is poisonous. You, don't want to that. you know, that's what they would say would cause you to go blind and stuff like that from moonshine and yeah. all that. So it's it's very important to get that out for safety and for the taste. So how long will the heads? kind of run out typically? It's usually a couple liters. At some point, you know, the first part is the poisonous part, obviously, but then it becomes more of a quality thing. I will actually keep it separate so I can blend it almost back together. But it ages in a neutral environment, like a stainless steel tank, except for the peach, is that right? Right, the peach is one of the ones that we put in oak barrels. When you make wine from grapes, you crush them, you de-stem them, then you press the juice out, 
So uh, normally we always used to take that back to the vineyard and, and it would decompose and it would add nutrients to the, the soil. But the Europeans, what they would do is they would take the skins, add a little bit of water, and then re-ferment it, and they'd get a considerable amount of alcohol out of there. Then they'd distill it, and, and you'd get what was traditionally called grappa. I'm excited to try it. Let's give it a taste now. Is okay. That okay. So uh, the way this is traditionally served is at room temperature, just like we're trying it right now. That is, it's hard to describe. It's almost like perfume. Mm -hmm. It's very floral and delicate. And all of those beautiful fruit flavors, they come right through the alcohol. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're picking it yourself. You're choosing, just like you do with your wine grapes, you're choosing exactly when you want to harvest so that you're, you can extract the most flavor out of it. This is best, uh, I guess, in the first five years, in its youth, because that's what you're trying to capture, those flavors. Can we try the other ones? Yes. I'd love to try these. Clearly, spirits are delicious to drink on their own, but you can also cook with them. And whiskey caramel sauce is delicious. So I am today going to be making an apple galette, which is essentially a free form, very rustic apple tart. And I'm gonna make a delicious whiskey caramel that we can kind of drizzle on top. It's gonna to be wonderful. And I'm making the whiskey caramel with a whiskey from Pinkney Ben, the folks that we met in New Haven, Missouri. And I'm going to be pairing this galette with a Stone Hill Cream Sherry. This is delicious. And it is from our good friends over at Stone Hill in the Herman region. And Cream Sherry is a fortified, sweet dessert style wine that's not too sweet. It has a, a really nice kind of bite to it. It's gonna go beautifully with the apples in that galette. So I'm gonna go ahead and get started. The galette dough is very, very easy. One cup of flour, and then we're gonna use regular cane sugar, just a tiny bit of salt, and then my butter. So all I need to do is just go in and work this with my fingers. And essentially what I'm doing is I'm coating all of the granules of flour with this wonderful butter, and it'll be finished when it's about the texture of cornmeal. And then I'm gonna stir in one egg. I'm gonna work this just a tiny bit longer and then I'm gonna turn it out onto the surface and knead it so that it's nice and smooth and elastic. Right now the dough feels elastic and slightly dense. It is not sticky, but it also is not terribly dry. It's got a really beautiful texture to it. So what I'm gonna do is form this into a disc and I'm going to wrap it in plastic wrap and put it in the refrigerator for just about 15, 20 minutes so that everything can kind of firm up and come together. I need to grab my apples. You can use pretty much any apple that you would like as long as it is firm and has something of a tart character because we're going to be adding, clearly, a bunch of sugar to this and we don't want an apple that's gonna get mushy we also don't want something that's too sweet. So we're just gonna peel these and then slice them and toss them with some cinnamon sugar. Now I'm gonna roll this into a 12 inch disc. Now I'm gonna go ahead and transfer the dough. And it is a delicate dough, so be careful. And now what I'm gonna do is just arrange the apple slices in a beautiful pattern from the inside, the center out. And the key is to leave about an inch and a half or two inches around the perimeter because that's what we're going to fold up and over the filling. I'm gonna sprinkle just a teeny tiny bit of flour on the top of this so that as it's baking, it doesn't get too soupy. And then I'm gonna to top it with a little bit more cinnamon and a little bit more sugar. Now, all you need to do 
is pleat the dough around the filling. And you're kind of forming like an envelope around all those beautiful cinnamon sugar apples, just like that. The surface has a nice egg wash on it. Now just a tiny little bit of sugar on the dough itself. I have my oven preheated at 375 degrees. I'm gonna pop this in. It'll take about 40 to 50 minutes. I'm gonna check it and rotate it once, halfway through cooking. Oh, here it is. It's beautiful and it smells fantastic. Now I'm gonna go ahead and make that caramel sauce, which is also very, very easy. All we're gonna start off with is cane sugar, water, and a little tiny bit of cream of tartar. Here's my little pinch of cream of tartar. All right, I'm just gonna stir this just to incorporate, and then I'm gonna let it sit. I'm not gonna touch it. I'm gonna go ahead and heat up some cream, butter, and a little bit of salt, because once this is exactly the right color, I'm gonna pour that in and stir it up. Two thirds of a cup of heavy cream, a tablespoon of butter, and a good pinch of salt. The caramel is starting to smell different. Instead of having a neutral aroma, it is starting to smell a little bit toasty and you can see just that light golden amber color, that, that chemical change is starting to happen. So we're at a beautiful, rich golden color. And again, it can very quickly go from perfect to burn. So keep your eyeballs on it. And now I'm gonna incorporate that hot cream. So I'm just gonna go ahead and stir. It smells so good. It smells like butter and sugar. Yum. Then I'm just gonna stir in my whiskey and I'm done. I'm only putting in about a tablespoon. You don't wanna overwhelm the flavor. I'm gonna plate this up. Just kinda of spoon that on top at will. Add as much or as little as you like. I like much. I go for much. This is a perfect pair with a cream sherry. It has a beautiful caramel note that's going to go perfectly with the caramel we just made and also play beautifully off of that cinnamon and all that brown sugar. Lovely stuff. Oh, I just can't wait to dig in. Thank you so much for joining me and I'll see you next time.